So I wonder what the story is behind 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We can infer some things, but I would love to just hear the, the gossip of what was going on in Corinth. Paul here is referring to a letter that he sent. And it sure seems like that what has happened in Corinth is again division. You remember in 1 Corinthians, the division was, I'm for Paul, I'm for Apollos, whatever. And it seems like those seeds never really went away. And what it appears happens is that somebody has not only said, well, I prefer Apollos to Paul, but has actually started accusing Paul. And it sounds like the, the majority has risen to Paul's defense. And they've said, hey, Paul, what should we do with this guy who, you know, doesn't give you proper honor? And again, it seems like maybe the accusation is, if Paul's so great, why is he suffering? You see, the chapter starts off by saying, for I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? He said, I love you guys. I don't want to speak harshly with you. I decided to write you a letter, be forceful, because I didn't want to come and, you know, stir the pot any more than I had to. Look down to verse four. He says, for I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish, of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. He, it sounds like there was a letter of rebuke, and it sounds like it was a letter of rebuke that insisted on forgiveness. We'll get to that in a minute. But Paul says, look, if my words were strong, my words were not strong so that um, you would know I'm, uh, I'm, I don't love you. Rather, and it was out of the abundance of love that I have for you that I wrote. And everybody in authority knows this. Sometimes you have to speak harshly <clears throat> out of love. Every parent knows this. Every teacher knows this. And Paul, as this apostle, as this pastor, he sees this. He says, man, I had to use harsh words. I had to really say, look, you got to be forgiving people. Stop being divided. And I did that out of love for you. And then look as he addresses this unnamed sinner who apparently has had something bad to say about Paul. That's been his sin as he's, he's gossiped about Paul. He's had some liable about Paul. He's, he's somehow been unloving towards Paul. And Paul says this, now, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused, it has not caused it to me, but in some measure, not to put it severely to all of you. He says, look, people can talk trash about me. It does. It, it, that's, that's not where I'm looking for my identity. It's not that he offended me. The problem here is that it caused division in the church. And that might be something we might understand as we discuss people and, you know, famous Christians, or even as, as we think about people at our own church, we would say, look, the, the thing is not, I cannot be offended because I'm so important. <laughs> at least it wasn't to Paul. To Paul, it was like, the problem here is that it's caused division in the church. And this is what we have to guard against. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. Again, I would love to know the story. Sounds like somebody started saying, Paul's not so great. If he's so great, why does he keep getting shipwrecked? And it sounds like the majority, like there was a, a, a very a very terse church meeting where this person was, you know, put in their place. So if you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he, he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So this person who has apparently had something bad to say about Paul, Paul says, look, he's had enough. The uproar by the majority is plenty. Now, please go forgive him and comfort him or else he'll be overwhelmed by sorrow. He'll be overtaken by sorrow. Paul's heart is that this guy would stay a Christian, that he would stay in the family, that this division would not section somebody off. And, you know, this is the terrible thing about church divides or church splits. A lot of times there's a church split, but there's just only one person on the, on one side of the split. And, you know, the Bible talks about people who've gone away from us and were never of us. And that's part of it. And sometimes people are just called to other churches or other fellowships. And that's fine too. But man, Paul says, look, do all you can to forgive this guy. Do all you can to comfort him. So he's not overtaken by sorrow, by grief. So he doesn't think everybody hates him. And it causes further division in the church. Look at verse 10. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. <laughs> Paul says, look, forgive him and forgive him in my name too. Tell him, tell him everything's okay. Indeed, what have I forgiven? If, if I have forgiven anything, 
It's been for your sake in the presence of Christ so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. So Paul says not only <clears throat> is division bad and unity good, not only is unity what we have to fight for in the church, but he says, man, there's an enemy here. Don't you guys see Satan's trying to outwit us? Somebody said something bad about me. The rest of the church went in uproar to defend me. Satan's got a plan he's working here to divide us. Look, I forgive him. You forgive him. Let's be family. It's a very profound and mature uh, perspective. Something all of us church leaders should take seriously and all of us in the church should take seriously. And then there's this profound, wonderful, I've watched a couple of these videos. I say the word profound an awful lot. Sorry about that. But there is this really wonderful and profound passage where Paul has the picture of a, a triumphant general coming into a town in his mind. And he says, look, I know you think that we are doing nothing but suffering. I know you think that, that as I'm traveling around and enduring persecution and getting run out of town, it's nothing but suffering. But let me tell you what's actually happening. Verse 14, he says, but thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. And you think about Paul being led away to prison or you think about Paul, you know, being grabbed by the scruff of his neck or shouted down in a town square. He goes, you know what that was? This was all triumphal uh, procession. Jesus has led us and through us. So Jesus is through us spreading the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God as we speak. So this picture would be of a general coming into a town and the, the town townspeople have gathered for the parade and there's going to be two sets of people there. There's going to be the conquered and the conquerors. There's going to be some Romans who have shown up and, you know, gotten the town under control. There's going to be the townspeople who are looking at Roman occupation and going, this is terrible for us. And Paul says, so there would be people with censers with fragrance coming up around. And as this Roman fragrance fills the, fills the town, Paul says, look, that fragrance to some is the fragrance of death because they look at this conqueror coming in and they go, this is terrible for us. To others who are on the side of the conqueror, they say, ah, that fragrance is life. And Paul says, this is the truth. People who are latching on to the story of Jesus, people who are giving themselves to Christ, who are aligning themselves with the conqueror, with the one who has conquered death, they hear of obedience to Christ. They see us in our suffering and it is the fragrance of life. And then there are those who have rejected Christ, who want to live in the same sinful place they've always been. And as they see the obedience to Christ and Paul and his companions, all they see is death. Who is sufficient for these things? Paul says, we're not like peddlers of God's word. We, we don't come trying to gain anything. Rather, we're commissioned by God and we're men of sincerity. So Paul is, is talking to these people and saying, look, forgive people, even if they talk trash about me. And you need to know what we're, we're about. What we're out, out here doing is we're sincerely spreading God's word and then understanding that sometimes that's going to be received as life and sometimes it's going to be received as death. When it's received as life, there's going to be good times for us. When it's received as death, there's going to be consequences in this world for us. And sometimes it involves suffering and persecution. But Paul says that's the life he wants to live. Elsewhere, he's going to say, don't be ashamed of us because of our persecution and suffering, but be unashamed. Man, Paul's a profound leader. Let's be a lot like him. Let's follow him as he points us to Christ. Hey, be loved.